Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, right, some no, of the students are probably too big that they can do better. Okay, what? so, uh, so we, we do have three speakers today, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Our first speaker is Daniel Harlow, who is um, a senior field here at the BHI. Uh, he is postdoc at Harvard, and today he'll be telling us about black holes, holographic, or holographic. That was holography. It should and be. Uh, I think there was my there was an autocorrect in the email. I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, well, it and, should be holography. And, and quantum information. <laughs> so take it away. Your email corrects everything to holography. My, my phone thinks when I type holography it should be holographic, and I, somehow I don't always catch it. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Okay, so yeah, I don't know. I, I tried to make this talk more at not at the higher energy people, though it seems like they're a higher fraction of the audience today, so sorry if you guys are bored. Uh, Principle that should be understandable by philosophers and mathematicians and astrophysicists, even if there aren't any here. Okay. Um, so, okay, let's first by, let's start out by just thinking about, so I'm a quantum gravity person, right? The main goal on my business card or whatever is to try and solve quantum gravity. Uh, this is not a new problem. Uh, it's been around for a long time. I mean, it's been around for 100 years, but really I would say in the last 60 years there have been semi serious efforts at the problem. Um, the other forces we know about, like E and M, uh, have long since uh, been combined with quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, we say quantum electrodynamics with a standard model, um, and uh, this has been accomplished within the framework of quantum field theory, uh, which uh, is our game that we talked about yesterday. Um, and quantum field theory, I would say, by now we understand it pretty well. You know, there are of course still things that we don't understand, and we hear have talks about them all the time. But the basic idea is uh, you have degrees of freedom at each point in space, and those degrees of freedom are interacting locally. Um, this formalism, I would say, has really failed uh, at, uh, at the task of quantizing gravity. Um, so I wanted to start by just reviewing, for people who say aren't experts, why this is. You know, what, what, what's, what's different about gravity versus Electromagnetism. I mean, naively, right? They're you know both one over r squared force and the IR. Why should quantizing one be so much harder than quantizing the other? Um, so let's first dispense with two things people sometimes say about this, which are wrong. Um, so one thing that isn't a problem is non-renormalizability. Uh, so it's true that the short distance divergences of general relativity are worse than those, say, of uh, electrodynamics with a standard <coughs> model. Um, but, you know, that's true in many other situations, too, right? Like in our theory of ions and nucleons, or uh, the Fermi theory of the weak interactions. Um, and it's just as bad. I mean, the non-normalizability of those theories is just as bad as that of general relativity. Um, but nonetheless, uh, these theories are, uh, can be fit into quantum field theories. We just have to include the appropriate UV degrees of freedom. Right? Whereas we don't think that's true for gravity. Uh, another thing which is not the problem is dynamical geometry, right? So unlike in the standard model, uh, when you quantize GR, uh, metric is dynamical, right? So, so since space-time itself is fluctuating, you know, who is time-like or space-like separated from who is fluctuating? Uh, and so, you know, it's things like the, say, the energy momentum tensor uh, don't, are, are no longer exist as our local operators uh, in the theory, right? So we, we're some sort of kosher quantum field theory they would. Um, but you know, this, I mean, this is a technical annoyance, right? I mean, but it's not that bad. I mean, similar things already show up in QED, right? I mean, we can't define local charged operators either. Uh, so, you know, just the fact that there's some gauge fixing involved, you know, who cares, right? I mean, and actually, in low enough dimensions, you know, quantum gravity is a path integral over metrics, uh, at least in some examples, such as the string roll sheet. So, just the fact that there's diffeomorphism and variance by itself is not an obstruction to having local path integral over gravity. Um, yeah. But would you agree that in, uh, in non renormalizability, <coughs> the difference between the two is that the UV completions that we know, they all are quantum field theory, they have a stress tensor, and that's uh, the, the only way we can. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, so, so right, so, so yeah, I guess I, but no, no, I think, I think like here, there, there are probably examples, we could probably come up with examples here. Where right, but say non normalizability was a big problem for the ion theory and the Fermi theory before they solved it. <coughs> yeah, yeah, but right, no, no, but the question is, the question is why haven't we solved this one yet, right? That one was solved a long time ago, and the reason was because we could solve it within quantum field theory. Um, you know, th this but, one... Sasha, I just think that people have proven that non-renormalizability is worse in some very precise sense, if you can't complete it with a yeah, no, quantum field theory. Well, we're, we're discussing that, we're going to discuss that in a minute, but I mean, so, so 
when we're not, so let's decide, the, define what I mean by quantum field theory, right? So, so there are things that are really, the standard definition of quantum field theory has a stress tensor and local operators, right? But for the point of view of this talk, because I'm not talking to experts, I'm also including into the fold path integrals that are diffeomorphism invariant. And actually, I think it's not that much of a crime. I mean, so for example, in Trin Simon's theory, it's also true that there are local operators and stress tensors and so on. Uh, it, the, the thing which I'm defining as quantum field theory for the point of view of this talk is that there's a path integral with an action which is local, you know, integral over, uh, over, over space, one integral. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, so I'm trying to explain why gravity is not one of those. <clears throat> okay, so these are two things that aren't the problem. Um, uh, the, what the real problem is that gravity has black holes. Um, so, uh, this is the real difference, right? So the, the universality of gravity means that you can have a, a region of strong gravitational coupling where since everything is charged, nothing can escape, right? If we somehow had something that wasn't charged under gravity, then we wouldn't have black holes. Um, you know, and when, I, and right, when I say black holes exist, right? I mean, look, they really exist here some. I mean, you know, I mean this is a real physics to understand black holes, right? It's not like I made up some particle that we might find at the LHC. I really need to understand this. Now, and, and indeed, classically, we understand black holes quite well, um, but quantum mechanically, I would say, um, they're really the, the main obstacle to finding a good theory of quantum gravity. They're the reason why we haven't just been able to write down some local action and quantize it and come up with a theory of quantum gravity. Um, there are additional cosmological issues which I'm not going to talk about. So the basic problem is that black holes really operationally prevent us from defining the kinds of localized observables uh, which uh, are the bread and butter of quantum field theory. And here I'm including diffeomorphism in varying quantum field theories. Um, here's the reason. So, you know, if we want to define localized observables, what we need to do is we need to say where they are. So, you know, let's say we use some network of uh, rods uh, to say where things are. Uh, and because we want to do quantum gravity, say, let's say we, try, we want to have the rods uh, you know, the lengths of the rods be aboard of the Planck scale. <coughs> well, you know, and then we could just say, you know, okay, I measure, you know, the, you know, something at the 22nd, you know, rod row and 23rd column and so on, and, and that would be a gauge invariant localized observable. Um, but there are two important constraints that our rods need to satisfy. Um, so one is that we want the whole collection of rods to not collapse into a black hole. Uh, and so this means that the linear size of this thing, and so here I'm really thinking of it as three-dimensional, although I drew it as two-dimensional. Uh, we want the linearized uh, size of this thing to be bigger than its short, the Schwarzschild radius of the whole collection. Um, so, okay, so this is some trivial algebra, and what you learn from it is that the mass of each individual rod needs to be small in Planck units. Um, but, okay, you, uh, so that, that's good, fine, so just make the rods light. And in, in classical general relativity, we can do that. Right, so in classical general relativity, this is not a problem. You know, we just have white rods, and we can uh, define operationally uh, what we're, you know, how, how we're doing things. Right, I mean, that's what the LIGO is doing. But uh, we're not doing classical gravity; we're doing quantum gravity. Uh, so there's an additional constraint, which is that we need to know where the rods are, despite the fact that there's the uncertainty principle. Um, so we want the fluctuations in the locations of the rod to be small compared to the distance we're trying to resolve. In this case, the Planck scale. Uh, but then again, if you just do sort of, you know, delta x it has to be bigger than 1 over delta p, and you assume things aren't too relativistic, then uh, you conclude exactly that the, the mass of the rod has to be large in Planck units. And so clearly we can't uh, satisfy both of these constraints, and so there's no operational way, at least along these lines, of defining localized observables in quantum gravity. And, 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 and I, I claim, oh, interesting. I claim this is what's different about gravity compared to the other forces. All right. Now, okay, but if gravity is not going to be a local theory, sense of being an integral over local action, then what's it going to be? Uh, well, fortunately for us, uh, there are some hints in this direction uh, from general relativity and quantum field theory. Uh, so here are the hints. So one is that just purely classical general relativity has this area theorem, which Incidentally, by now is experimentally confirmed uh, in LIGO, or at least tested, confirmed is a strong word, um, that uh, you know, whatever dynamical processes are going on in the, in the vicinity of the event horizon, the event horizon always gets bigger. 
And so that suggests that the area, of, or sorry, the area of it gets bigger. So it might be thought as an entropy. Uh, and indeed, uh, if you do quantum field theory in curved space time, you find that black holes radiate at a temperature which is consistent with the idea that the entropy is the area of the horizon in Planck units. So this suggests that in quantum gravity, we should really think um, that the numbers of degrees of freedom, right, is, in a spatial region is sub-extensive. All right, because this, this goes like the area, the surface area of the region, not like the volume of the region. Whereas if you had something like a quantum field theory where you, know, you had independent degrees of freedom at each point in space, then you would think, say, at high enough temperature that you could uh, have all of those uh, degrees of freedom be independently excited and you can get an extensive uh, er uh, entropy. Um, but here it's apparently not, not possible in gravity. Um, the, the entropy of the region is sub-extensive. <coughs> So inspired by this, uh, so this is called the Bekenstein-Hawking formula. So inspired by the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, um, Chodvin Suskin proposed this holographic uh, principle, which says that a theory of quantum gravity uh, in these spatial dimensions uh, should really be understood as a local theory, uh, you know, local in the sense of localized degrees of freedom, uh, but in a lower number of dimensions. And you know that that may that may seem crazy. Probably to most people, it sounded crazy the first time they heard it. Um, but actually, by now, there are two examples of this. So this one, this was the first one. I would say it's less well understood. Uh, and then the one that's the best understood is this ADS-CFT correspondence that says that conformal field theory in d dimensions uh, without gravity is equal to gravity in d, at least uh, d plus one dimensions. So, so for the rest of the talk, uh, well, okay. So I mean, right. So you know, we're, you know, how can this be true, right? You know, these people say it's true. They're smart, so it, it's probably true. But I mean, come on, right? This is crazy, you know. We, li we clearly live in three plus one dimensions, at least that's a large number of dimensions. Uh, how can it be that you know, secretly we're living in a lower number of dimensions? So um, I would say in, in the past few years, we've understood this a lot better. You know, where does this extra dimension come from? Uh, what does it have to do with black holes? You know, why is gravity important for getting this extra dimension? Uh, and so in the rest of the talk, uh, I'm going to try to explain at least some sketch of uh, where this extra dimension is coming from for this case of ADS CFT. So that was the introduction. Any uh, conceptual questions? Or, yeah. So does, will these lower dimensions have no black holes? Yeah. Yeah, so the lower dimensional theories don't have gravity. Uh -huh. Yeah, so it, it's a lower dimensional theory without gravity equals higher dimensional theory with gravity. And so now black holes are supposed to be the thing that makes that OK. And so that's what I'm going to try and convince you of a little more quantitatively. Um, all right, so, so here's ADS-CFT. It says that quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS space, so that's on the left here, G Newton is not zero, quantum gravity, uh, uh, is equivalent to conformal field theory living on the boundary. So, so anti sitter space, that's the ADS, right? That's the thing on the left here. This is basically like living inside of a can. So you're like you're living in the soup, right? This is us sitting there in the middle of the soup, and you know it, it, it's this this space time. It has the funny property that. Well, the cosmological constant is negative instead of positive. So instead of things accelerating away from you, they accelerate towards you. So like if I took this pointer and I was living in ADS and I threw it away from me, and I waited for a while, after a while it would turn around and come back to me. And, that's, and, and it's true actually even, well usually I make this joke with a laser pointer, but had I had a laser pointer and I, and I shined the laser pointer, then still the photons would come back and I would see them again. Right? And so that's what this dashed line here is indicating. It's even light. Uh, because the space is sort of rushing in, it sort of tries to get out, but then it comes back to the finite time. Um, so, and then ADS-CFT is sort of saying that the, 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 the gravity inside of the soup is equal to not having gravity in the can, on the can. Like, so, the, so the conformal field theory is living on the surface of the can, uh, and, uh, um, but it, it's secretly describing gravity in the soup. Okay, and here's the, here's the metric. Uh, well, maybe I won't. So this is a, a quantum correspondence I want to emphasize. So, um, so if we look at a fixed time slice in the bulk, so then the geometry is this Escher kind of thing, um, then a, a state of that on that time slice, a quantum state, is supposed to correspond to a, a quantum state on the boundary of that disk here, right? Because the time slice of the boundary is this, is this line here that I've shown um, shaded. And so not only are the states in one-to-one -one correspondence, but so are the operators. So for example, the Hamiltonian 
It's the same on both sides, the angular momentum. Uh, the other asymptotic symmetries in the bulk correspond to global symmetries in the boundary. Um, and then um, there's this nice property that if I take something in the bulk, which is, you know, say localized somewhere, and then, right, so there's the radial direction and time, and then omega is this angular direction. And I, I take something localized here and I pull it to the boundary by doing this, some sort of extrapolation procedure here. Then what I'm left with is a local operator in the boundary uh, at the point where I pulled the operator to. Okay, so, so, so that's the sense in which the locality in the boundary theory is compatible with the locality in the bulk. At least to some extent. Uh, and then we can say a little bit more about how the states work, right? So, so low energy states in the conformal field theory correspond to perturbations of the vacuum here, you know, rabbits on zipping around, maybe planets or something. Uh, and then higher energy uh, excitations of the CFT correspond to black holes in the bulk. Uh, and we'll say a little bit more about that later. Okay, so, so, so far, that's just sort of ADS CFT uh, sort of 101. <coughs> So now, now let's now let's start trying to get at this question of where you know why is it paradoxical that there's this emergent radial direction? So in, in quantum field theory, uh, causality, uh, you know, Lorentzian invariant causality is enforced by commutativity of operators at space-like separation. <coughs> this is actual, you know, this is you know quantum field theory, you know, first day of class. Uh, you know, if you want theory to be Lorentz invariant, then it better not be that if I measure something here, it affects what you see there at space-like separation. Uh, and so that's this is a mathematical expression of that. Now, uh, if we think the bulk is local, and well, certainly at least for us, it seems pretty damn local, right? You know, in this room, it seems pretty local. So there's got to be at least some sense in which there's uh, commutativity at space-like separation also in the bulk. So in particular, let's say we have one of these, you know, some sort of localized bulk operator in the center there, phi of x, uh, <coughs> in the center of this time slice. Well, this, this phi of x is space-like separated from all of the local operators uh, on a time slice on the boundary, right? So if O of x is a local operator at the boundary, remember it's just the extrapolation of some bulk operators. So, uh, so these guys are space-like separated in the bulk, uh, and so you might think that they commute by locality in the radial direction. But remember, now this is this weird radial, this is locality in this weird extra radial direction. But the funny thing is that this is actually impossible in quantum field theory. This is not an equation that can be realized, at least not unless the operator phi of x is a trivial operator. So, so, in quantum, so, so and, and this is really the, the tension of how a, how a lower dimensional theory can be equal to a higher dimensional theory. So let, let's try to understand that a little better. So it commutes yeah. for any distance short of the boundary, but at the boundary it doesn't commute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, yeah. If you were doing quantum field theory in the bulk, that's what you would expect. You'd expect that these two guys uh, commute until I move this one all the way over so that it's on top of that one. And so that's a basic algebraic thing that we think should be true in the bulk, but now we're, if we try to make it be true in the CFD, we're going to run into a problem. Uh, and the problem is that in a quantum field theory, um, an operator that commutes with all local operators at a fixed time must be a trivial operator. Or I suppose if we want to be technically correct, we should say it must be topological. Um, but uh, let's just say trivial, in other words, proportional to the identity. Um, so for example, consider uh, a chain of poly spins. So this could be like a model of the boundary theory. We just have a bunch of spins independent you know, at each point on this, on this time slice of the boundary. Um, well, it's a basic fact about poly operators that products of the poly operators on the different spins, so let's say the spin z, spin x, spin y on different ones of the spins, but if we take products, that's a basis for all the operators uh, that, you, um, that act on the Hilbert space. So if you have something that commutes with all of the individual poly operators, then it's going to commute with all of their products too, and so it's going to commute with everything, all operators, and then it has to be proportional to the identity. So somehow holography has to solve this problem, right? Because this is this is a basic expression of the local structure of the Hilbert space of the CFT. You can't have something that commutes with all the local operators. Uh, but somehow that seems to be precisely what the bulk is demanding of us, right? It's demanding that this operator here is commuting with all the local operators of the boundary. Somehow it must not really be demanding that of us, right? Because otherwise this would be a, a proof that the correspondence can't be correct, which obviously isn't going to be the lesson under itself. So something more interesting has to be going on. 
But how do you, like, how do you, five, this little five could be connected to some line. Uh, yeah, yeah, good. So to make it gauge invariant, you indeed have to collect it to a line, and then there's a grown-up version of this argument. So let me just say the sentence, but then I won't expect everyone to follow it. So, so because because there's diffeomorphism invariance in the bulk, at least, never mind, or possibly also other charges, we have to attach a line to this operator running up to a point in the boundary. Yeah, that it yeah. yeah, let me finish. So, so then what we now conclude is that it has to commute with all the operators in the boundary except for the operators at the end of the line. Yeah. So if that's correct then uh, this uh, kind of argument, what it now says is that um, that operator has to be a local operator at that point in the CFT, okay? And that's still inconsistent. It's inconsistent with causality. Because, for example, I can send a signal to this point from down here from a point that's space-like separated from that point. So there's still a, there's still a puzzle with you once you've included that. <coughs> okay. Um, good. Now, there's another related puzzle. Um, so, uh, to, to explain the other puzzle, I have to develop the dictionary a little bit more. So, so far we talked about operators near, that are right at the boundary or just local operators in the CFT, but then we we're also discussing these ones in the center. Uh, what do those look like? Well, the details don't matter too much, but essentially if you have some operator localized somewhere else in the bulk, there's still a sort of fairly standard machinery for representing that as an operator in the Hilbert space of the CFT. You use the operator that it's dual to, and then you smear it against some kind of kernel, where the support of this kernel I've shaded green on the boundary. And then the funny thing is that it's, it's not really unique how you choose this R. So the same operator in the bulk can be represented in different ways. It can be represented on the whole boundary like this, or on a sub, say on a subregion of the boundary like, like this. Um, and the subregion one is especially interesting, so let me, let me say it again. So, so, so now I've just taken this time slice in the center. You see, and I'm looking at it from above. Um, so the way it works is if I pick a subregion of the boundary, let's say this A here, then um, I can draw a geodesic from one end to the other, a more generally uh, extremal area surface. Uh, and then an operator which is inside the geodesic has a representation in the CFT with support only in terms of the spins in A, if you like, only in terms of the degrees of freedom in A. Whereas this operator here, which is outside of the shaded red region, does not have a representation uh, just on the subregion A. In fact, it has a representation on its complement. Uh, okay, and this leads to some, some funny kind of situation. So here's, here's my favorite one. So, so say we split the boundary into three regions, A, B, and C, and we consider some operator in the bulk in the center. So now this point in the center is not inside of any one of the shaded regions for these guys. But if I consider the union of any two, so say A and B together, then now the geodesic is like this, and now the operator is there. So this operator has the funny property that it can be represented in the boundary either on AB or on AC or on uh, BC. Um, so that's kind of crazy, right? Like where is the information, right? The information is not accessible from any one region of the boundary, but it is accessible from any two. It seems like those things all can't really be equivalent operators in the quantum field theory, basically for the same kind of reasons we were discussing before. But at least from the bulk point of view, they're just related by Bogolubov transformation. So if you know what Bogolubov transformation is, then these, that, that's what relates these different representations in the bulk. Okay, good. So now, uh, in the last couple of years, um, I would say it's been understood that these puzzles and other features of the correspondence, such as the Ritakanagi formula that we discussed uh, in my seminar, Friday, um, can be understood by reinterpreting the correspondence as a quantum error correcting code. Uh, so uh, I should say, by the way, I'm not necessarily expecting everyone to follow all the details here. The idea is to just sort of give you a sense of the kinds of things that people are thinking about. Um, so, you know, so, right, so, so, and, okay, so what is a quantum error correcting code? Well, you probably don't know that either, so uh, let's discuss. Um, so quantum error correcting codes were invented to protect quantum computers from the environment. So when you're making a quantum computer and you're trying to run Shor's algorithm to factor 5 into 3 times 5, uh, 15 into 3 times 5, um, <laughs> then um, you, you need to worry that while you're in the process of, of doing the algorithm, you know, that, that the fact that your computer is connected you know, to the environment it isn't going to screw up the computation. So, so, so quantum error correction is designed to fix that. And the basic idea is you... The message you want to protect, such as you know the fact that now that you know that one of the factors is five, but you haven't yet figured out that the other one is three, 
uh, needs to be protected by encoding it non-locally in the entanglement between many degrees of freedom. So that's the basic idea of quantum error correction. Um, and you know, so there's some whole general theory of this, which we could talk about, and it would be fun, but uh, it would also be long, so instead we're just going to discuss one example. So, so this is holography for dummies. It really, you can't, it, it, I don't think holography can be simplified more than this, really. So, so instead of the CFT, I'm just going to have three degrees of freedom on the boundary, these pink things. And each one of them is going to be a Q-trit. So it's going to be a three-dimensional Hilbert space, zero, one, or two. So the total Hilbert space is 27-dimensional. Uh, and we started late. Um, <laughs> these uh, three, uh, so then, um, so, so that's like the CFT. The CFT is a lattice CFT. It has three sites, and each site has a three-state system. In the bulk, uh, there is one. So the bulk theory is also a lattice theory. It's even simpler. It has one lattice point. And here it is, this blue one in the center. And so, so you see, if, if I've set things up correctly with this picture, then this blue point should be accessible from any two of the boundary Q-trits. Uh, and that's exactly the kind of thing that quantum error correcting codes are good at doing. They're good at you know, preserving the message, even though we lost some of the degrees of freedom. OK, so the details of maybe we don't need to go through in too much detail, but OK. So the, the, the bulk Q-trit, that one degree of freedom, we encode into the boundary one with a three-dimensional subspace. Here it is. Uh, these are all entangled states. Uh, it's very symmetric. Um, it's so entangled that if you take any state in the subspace spanned by these guys, uh, then it looks maximally mixed on any one of the Q-trades. Um, so in other words, any single Q-trade has no information about the encoded state. Uh, and in fact, not only is that true, we can completely recover the state uh, from any two of the boundary Q-trades. OK, so how does that work? Well, OK. So say we just have the first two of the Q-trades. So I claim that if you take this unitary transformation on two Q-trits and you apply it to these states, then what you get is you just read which state you applied it to, 0, 1, or 2, onto the first Q-trit, and then you have some extra residual state on the second two. Um, so, so then if we take this psi tilde, some encoded state in that subspace, then we can just decode it onto the first Q-trit. Um, and then by symmetry, we can also do it onto the other two. Similarly, and maybe I won't go through the details, if we have an operator that acts in that subspace, then we can represent that operator on any two of the Q-trits. So because we can represent the operator on any two of the Q-trits, uh, that automatically guarantees us that it commutes with any single Q-trit operator. So, so then we automatically have this sort of radial commutativity. So an operator acting in the center uh, so this O tilde acting on that blue dot in the center automatically commutes with any operator on the single Q trace. And it's not, it's not in contradiction with the paradox uh, because we only require that this hold in the code subspace. Okay, now, now we'll move on. Um, so the question is, what, well, okay, fine. So, okay, fine. So you were able to reproduce this bulk effective field theory of this one degree of freedom in the center here. So that's three, that's three dimensions of the Hilbert space. What about the other 24? So far, I only told you about a small fraction of the Hilbert space. Well, the key here is that you should think of the rest of the Hilbert space as being the microstates of a black hole, which is smaller than our point. So, uh, uh, so um, and then we don't need to make sense of the point, um, because it's far enough behind the horizon that it's inaccessible, even to people who fall in. OK, so that was a lot to hit you with. So now let's just try and summarize the conclusions quickly. So. Uh, if we try and make the code subspace too large and still have this operator commute with everybody on the boundary, we fail. Um, but we can do it as long as we don't make it too large. So, so you know, the, if we try to probe the locality too precisely, um, the locality in the radial direction does break down. And okay, in this model, this may seem arbitrary because what's the black hole anyway, and where's the bulk, and so on. Um, but you can actually extend this conclusion in general with ADS-CFT. Um, so there's a theorem in quantum error correction about how big the code subspace can be. And you can see parametrically that, uh, that you're going to run out of the ability to construct things here right when the code subspace gets so big that in the bulk you would form the black hole. OK, promise uh, last slide. So uh, OK, the, there's obviously tons more you can say here. Um, and I should say, this kind of gets back to where we started, right? You know, you're sort of trying to cram too much stuff into a region, and uh, then the locality breaks down, right? That's what we were saying with the rods. Um, 
Okay, so, okay, now, uh, well, you can also, you can think about the radial direction, right? So, we, so, okay, we saw that we could get stuff to commute with everything at the boundary. We can more generally interpolate, right? So things in the center are correspond to things that are very well protected. You need to do a very large erasure to pollute them. Uh, things that are near the boundary are not so well protected. Uh, so, so, so the radial direction in holography is literally just the question of how well protected the information is. Okay, and then there are generalizations of the three Q-trit thing where, where the bulk is sort of more manifest. So in, I won't explain the picture, but each of these dots now corresponds to a bulk degree of freedom, these red dots. Uh, and, you know, things that are here can be represented on this whole big region. Things here can be represented on this smaller one. Uh, there are black holes. Now you can see that the black holes have an entropy that grows like the or area. Um, so, you know, I would say we're really, uh, with these kinds of models, you know, I mean, we haven't solve everything about holography, but we're really getting at the core of how the existence of black holes enables us to have locality in a higher number of dimensions in a theory that really only has locality in a lower number of dimensions. Okay, so that's, uh, and if you want to know more about it, just ask me. Thanks. Okay, so first, apologies, the clock uh, decided to kindly give you ten and five minute warnings, so I think you deserve another round of applause for having our first 30 minutes so, so does that mean the rods are black holes, and that's okay? Uh, no, I mean, there are rods which aren't black holes, right? I mean, here's one. Uh, no, the, yeah, but, but this is a rather long rod. It's not, that, it's not that heavy. I mean, if I wanted to take these kinds of things and resolve Planckian distances with them, then yes, they would come out the black hole. And, and, and that's what, that's what mean, you know, and that's why, you know, you sort of don't really need to make sense of, of volumes worth of degrees of freedom at that scale. You know, you, you can try, but then when you think you're, you know, you can say, ah, CFT, I know, I'm going to catch you. You say you're a higher dimensional theory, but I know you're really a lower dimensional theory. So I'm going to put stuff here, and I'm going to put more and more stuff here, right? And then right, right when I think I'm finally going to force you to demonstrate to me a volume law, uh, then you say, ha ha, no, made a black hole. <laughs> but that, that's kind of how holography is working. Uh, at least in the CFT and in these examples. Okay, well, let's thank you again. So our next speaker today is uh, Anna Parnaka. Uh, Anna is an, an Einstein fellow here at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and she's an expert in, in high energy emission and also uh, strong gravitational lensing. So today she's going to tell us about uh, resolving the high energy universe. Thank you. I can open my laptop. Yeah. into high resolution telescope and we'll use it to look uh, to find out where gamma ray flares are produced uh, by extra galaxy jets. So extra galaxy jets are the largest particle accelerator in the universe. They transport energy from regions very close to supermassive black hole up to hundreds of kiloparsecs into galactic space. They also produce emission from radio up to very high energy gamma rays. And this image shows one of the most famous uh, extragalactic jets in our local universe, pictured in X-rays. So this is M87. And those uh, extragalactic jets, they are also known to produce very violent variability. And we believe, we assume that this violent variability is produced somewhere very, very close to supermassive black hole. In 2004, Chandra instrument detected huge outbursts from M87 and thanks to improved angular resolution of Chandra instrument down to 0.5 arc second, we have learned that this huge gamma ray, uh, X-ray flare was not originating from the core where the supermassive black hole is, but was originated from one of the nodes along the jet HST1. 
and the distance between the radio core, where the supermassive black hole is, and this node along the jet HST1 is about 60 parsecs. And at the same time, when we detected this high energy X-ray emission, we also detected the TV flare with Cherenkov telescopes. But with Cherenkov telescopes, we cannot resolve emission from those extra galactic jets, so we don't know whether this TV flare was also originating from HST1 node or somewhere close to the massive black hole. What, is it, what are the colors on that picture? Is the frequency? Here? Yeah, the green and the blue. Uh, this is intensity. intensity. How many photons we see? X-ray photons we see. So, to resolve gamma ray emission, we would have to improve angular resolution of current instruments by a factor of 1,000. <coughs> Example of MT7 makes us further wonder how frequently emission, this variable emission, is not originating from the region very close to the massive black hole, like MT7, but is originated somewhere, is produced somewhere along the jet. And the answer to this question is very important because we monitor these variable sources to measure gravitationally induced time delays, which we use to measure the Hubble constant. So if we have multiple emitting regions, variable emitting regions along the jet, it can result in statistical errors, systematic errors in measure in our calculation of Hubble constant. Do we know, are, are the knots moving along the jet, or do they just appear yes. in one spot? So it depends, because some of the knots are stationary, and some of them we see that this is plasma, it's plasma ejected that moves across the speed of light. And we see apparent velocity. So actually, because when jet is pointed toward us, we see also relativistic effect. So we see, we observe motion faster than the speed of light. Because we have this relativistic effect, and jet is pointed toward us. So some of those knots are moving and some of them are stationary. So what angle is that, that you, we're looking down at the jet at an angle? So in the case of MIT-7, yeah. the angle is 15 degrees. So the thing is really about 10 times as long, or five times? The jet is yes. about five times as it looks on that picture? Uh, yes, yes. So um, the distance, 60 parsecs, is a projected distance. So the real distance is about 250 parsecs. The real distance from the supermassive black hole. And also, uh, what is the origin of gamma ray flares? And the answer to this question is very important because to understand the mechanism of the particle accelerator, to, uh, to understand how particles are accelerated in those jets, we have to know where the acceleration is happening. We assume that those gamma ray flares are produced somewhere close to the black hole. But case of M87 show us that we have a reason to doubt this assumption. And we could resolve M87 because it's a nearby source. But we cannot resolve more distant sources or at higher energies. Or can we? What if M87 was gravitationally lensed? In such configuration between us and distant and extragalactic jet, there would be a galaxy. Massive galaxy curves the space-time. And curved space-time tells the light how to move. In such configuration, the multiple images, mirage images of the source will be produced. And those mirage images would have a different, uh, the photon would travel for different paths and different gravitational potential. So we would have a time delay between those, between those mirage images. And those time delays between the mirage images depend on the position of the source in the lens plane. So if we can measure those time delays, we can find out from where the emission is coming from. So now imagine M87 at redshift equals 1, and that between us and M87, there is a massive galaxy. And then we would have a different time delays depending if flare originated from the core, plus to supermassive black hole, or from HST1 knot. In such configuration, the difference in the time delay between core or HST1 would be about two days. We can measure time delays with much greater accuracy, which means that we can use this time delay measurement to find out from where the emission is coming from. And we have gravitationally lensed blazers that are also gamma ray emitters. One of them is B20218. So here we can see the radio image. Sorry, what's a blazer? Blazer, it's a quasar 
uh, when we have a jet yeah. pointed toward us under a small angle of few degrees, then we call it blazer. So it's a quasar with a jet, with jet toward us. So we have a lot of relativistic effects. So here is this jet gravitationally lensed. So we see two mirage images of the radio core. They are separated by about 330 milli arc seconds. And we know also that the time delay between those mirage images of the radio core is about 10.5 days. We can see also that there is the Einstein ring. Einstein ring is produced when the emission is close, close to the center of the lens. So because we see the Einstein ring here, we know that it's produced from the extent the emission of the, of the jet. So we know that the jet must go through the center of the lens. So we have a position of the radio core, and we know also that the jet is going through the center of the lens, so we know the projection of the jet. We have also much more radio observations, and when we combine all of those observations, we can reconstruct very precisely the model of the lens. And using Monte Carlo simulations, I was able to reproduce the position of the mirage images down to one milli arc second, which means that the resolution of the lens, if we use this galaxy as a telescope, the resolution will be one milli arc second. So we have well resolved mass distribution of the lens, and so what we do, we do now, we need the time delay. And this object, B20218, have a huge gamma ray flare. And Wait, is it really simple to see that that's a lens, not just other stuff that's emitting? Yes, yes, it's really obvious. Because of the ring. Because of the ring, and we have two images, and so with radio we can really uh, mm -hmm. distinguish. We have plenty of radio observations, so mm -hmm. this is exactly what we would expect to see. So for those sources, it's really very obvious that we have that it's gravitational lens. So at radio, where we can resolve those uh, uh, those objects we can determine whether they are gravitationally lens. Then at gamma rays, we cannot resolve images. But with satellites like Fermi, like for example Fermi, uh, we can measure the flux each three hours. So we have beautiful light curves. And uh, at gamma rays, there is a lot of variability. So we can use those light curves to measure gravitationally induced time delays. And during this huge gamma ray flare, I measured that the time delay was 11.4 days. That's the delay between what and what? Uh, this is in gamma rays. So between the mirage images of the uh, gamma ray source. And you can see that the difference between the gamma ray time delay and the radio time delay is about one day. But at radio, we cannot measure the time delay very precisely. You can see that at, at gamma rays, the precision of the measurement of this time delay is about four, three hours. When at the radio, the time you can measure time delay down to 12 hours, which means that even if we, that we see that the time delay, that the, the difference between the radio and gamma ray is about one day, if we use only time delay, we cannot tell significantly from where the emission is coming from. Why is that? Why in the radio you cannot do it? Better than because we don't have that uh, many variability, because here the variable time scales are of the order of hours, and at radio we don't have it, so we have to use different uh, idea. What's the difference between red and black curves? Uh, Binning. This is Binning. So it's the same light curve, but with different Binning. So we will use different idea. So traditionally, a time delay combined with the position of these mirage images and the lens were used to measure the Hubble constant. But we know Hubble constant from Planck. So we can invert this idea and use Hubble constant in combination with the time delay in position of the images to find out from where the emission is coming from. And uh, at gamma ray, we have a very precise time delay. And at radio, we have a very well resolved position of the image images. So when the gamma ray time delay is from the same region as uh, resolved uh, radio images, then we should get the right Hubble constant. But if the time delay was originated from a different place, you would get the wrong Hubble constant. And the difference between the true, uh, true Hubble constant and what we get will correspond to the distance between the emitting regions. So let's apply this idea. 
So when we combine the position of the radio uh, mirage images with the radio time delay, we get the Hubble constant of 67.3, which is consistent with the with flight measurement. But then we know also this is the position of the radio core, which corresponds to the true uh, Hubble constant. We know from that because we see the Einstein radius, the Einstein range, we know that the jet is pointed to this in this direction. So the black hole must be somewhere in this direction. So now when we combine position of the radio images with the gamma ray time delay, we get Hubble constant 63. We know that it's a brown Hubble constant. And the difference between Hubble, true Hubble constant and the one we got correspond to the distance between the emitting regions of about 50 parsecs. And this is interesting because we assume that supermassive black hole and the gamma ray flares are produced where the radio core is. But from here we can see that this is a huge difference, huge distance. And that's, so we find that uh, this huge gamma ray flare is not originate, does not originate from the radio core as commonly believed. And we can test this. So if it's not originate from the radio core, then we shouldn't see radio emission during this huge gamma ray flare, and we don't. So this is, those are the radio light curves. And during this huge gamma ray flare, there was no activity from the radio core. But that, that's not the end of the story, because then two, two years later, we have another flare. And during the second flare, the time delay was 11, around 11 days. So the, the two black ones have the person in the previous slide? Previous slide. So on the radio, that well, it's a 40 meter telescope. Okay, so you're looking at the total flux density. You're not using the interferometry. You can't no. tell the difference between the core versus the HSP one. So this one, this was the one result. So here you can. Okay, so on the right is just the core. Yes, yes. You don't see anything downstream. So you see only radio core, and you interpret it as the brightest emission. So we can talk about. The question is, what's the physical origin of mm -hmm. the radio core, of the radio emission in this laser? So we don't see any emission at the position of the gamma ray flare. We see only this bright spot, and there was no variability. So then we have a second flare with a time delay of 11 days, which is shorter than the previous time uh, than the previous flare, and it's kind of interesting because now we can put use this time delay to again find out from where what was the origin, special origin of this uh, second flare. And the physical origin, the special origin of the flare two, is somewhere between the flare one and the radio core. So now we can assume that, let's consider that this uh, flare two was caused by the same blob of plasma that was ejected somewhere close to the black hole and moves toward the radio core. So we, from, uh, from the time delay, we know the distance between the flare two and flare one. We know also that the second flare happened two years later, so we can calculate what, how fast this uh, blob of plasma is moving. And the apparent velocity is about 70 times the speed of light. But then we can make another assumption. So let's consider that those two events are indeed connected, and this is the blob of plasma moving toward the radio core. So we can estimate when this blob of plasma will reach radio core. And this should happen July 2016. So I hope you are curious to see <laughs> what happened. Okay, did it happen? Oh, my time is. <laughs> okay, so that was the floor number one. Floor number two, July 2016, beginning of the floor. It was predicted before. Yeah. So we still had a lot of work to make sure that it was that it's from the radio core, but July 2016, and we have another flare. So. But that's in the gamma rays. That's in the gamma rays. I thought you said it, it's going to be in the radio rays. From the radio core, a gamma, yes. But the origin is consistent now with the position of the radio core. So this time. Flare? So uh, with radio, we still 
uh, have to trigger observations and to see what's going on. So the assumption is whatever is the physical origin of the gamma ray flare. So this stuff happens at the same location as, as the radio curve, and before it was far away. But there's still locations where whatever thing is coming through is generating gamma ray flares, so it may be dense in the laser or something or other. And the assumption is that one of them is coincident with whatever gives rise to the radio core. Uh, so, so the thing is that we have multiple ending regions. Sure. And um, this one, we have a few different ways to... Uh, now we know that the time is consistent with um, interaction with the radio, the predicted uh, interaction with the radio core. Now the question is whether the time delay is consistent with the position of the radio core. Uh, my preliminary analysis says that yes. And uh, now to have like a smoking gun for that, you would like to see increased radio emission as well from the radio core. The question is that we don't really know what we should print, what we should see. <laughs> so let me quickly summarize. So at radio we have an excellent angular resolution. At gamma rays we have an excellent temporal resolution. The Hubble parameter gives us this cosmic scale and Gaussian lensing allow us to combine all of the above. And this is what we have learned. We have learned that even from the si for the single source we can have a multiple time delays, which means that this is the systematic error for the Hubble constant measurement when we use gravitational induced time delays then we've been able to get the special resolution at gamma rays of one million arc second. This is improvement by a uh, million times as compared to gamma ray detectors. Then this allows us to find out that the gamma ray flare was not originating from the radio core and that the radio core is not the, the central engine. And we've been also able to make the prediction for of further flares. possible that substructure in the lens galaxy is affecting your results? For example, if you're lensing a, a finite source and you have substructure uh, no. in the lens, so no. you, your lens model takes into account, or are you looking for the get So the answer is that substructure appear on the appear on the uh, scale smaller than one million arc second. That's why I focus, uh, I stop resolving the lens at one million arc second. If you would like to look on a scale smaller than one million second, then yes, substructure can introduce errors. And the other thing is that um, if it's due to the lens, then you would expect to have time delays, uh, the same time delays all the time. Okay. And because we see that, that the time delay is changing, it means that this is intrinsic to the source, not to the lens. But doesn't the time delay depend on the, the size of the emitting region and the source? Not time the delay. Area? No, in the micro lensing, Yes, you have the, the time scale of the microlens event does depend on the size of the source. And here, the size of the source, when we have a variability, is much smaller as compared to the Einstein radius, so it's um, negligible. It will not affect the time delays, macro time delays. It is important for, mic for micro right. lensing, and here we're talking about the strong So I guess you can't have any substructure with an Einstein radius small enough. Was it just a lucky break that there was something lensing M87, or or is there so much stuff out there you'd expect that? Or? So this is different source. This is different blazer. A different blazer. This is this is different blazer. I yes, see. this is one of the blazers. So it's not an M87. It's a different uh, blazer, <coughs> which is the. So you look you look around and you got lucky and you found a blazer that was. A lens in front of it. So uh, at gamma rays, we know about a few thousand bla blazers, yeah. and um, the lensing probability is usually like one per thousand is gravitational lensed because those are very distant objects. Right, so right. the chance that you will have a galaxy is pretty high. So usually we expect that one per thousand uh, bla uh, one per thousand blazer is gravitational lensed. So at gamma rays, we have two gravitational lensed blazers for which I did. Uh, this analysis. So it's consistent with the probability of finding those objects. Okay, let's take that again.
So our third speaker is uh, going to use the whiteboard, so maybe we'll take a minute to... Uh, Daniel Spopek, who's a graduate student here at Harvard, working with Andy, and he'll be telling us about the extended VMS group. Yeah, so thanks for uh, inviting me to give a talk. I want to discuss uh, some recent work on the extended VMS group and some of those consequences for gravitational scattering. I'll be sort of brief and schematic if you want more details, you can see these two papers are all written in collaboration with uh, several people in the high energy theory group, including Andy Strominger, Anurag Baru, uh, Bahar Mitra, and Sabrina Pastorsky. Uh, and the basic question that all of this work is trying to answer is just, uh, what are the actual symmetries of quantum gravity in asymptotically flat uh, space times? So, it's sort of an interesting question because Gravity is notoriously difficult to UV complete, and so you'd like to have all of the symmetries of the problem at hand to help you construct the theory, sort of have an organizing principle. Um, it's certainly been a very fruitful way to think about quantum gravity in, in and anti sitter space, and it leads you sort of directly to our best definition of quantum gravity in ADS in terms of the dual conformal field theory, so you might hope that you could play similar games for asymptotically flat uh, theories. It also turns out to not be a completely trivial question. Uh, so you might have thought that in asymptotically flat space times at large distances, far away from all of the complicated gravitational dynamics, uh, the GR should just sort of reduce the appropriate limit to special relativity. So the appropriate symmetry group should just be the finite dimensional Poincaré group. Uh, and that is what people thought for a long time, which is why it was a big surprise in the 1960s when Bondi, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs just sat down and explicitly computed the asymptotic symmetry group and found not a finite dimensional Poincaré group, but an infinite dimensional extension, uh, which is called uh, the BMS group. <laughs> Somehow Vandenberg got uh, left out of, the, out of this group. Uh, yeah, so, so just to, to basically remind you of a quick cartoon of what BMS were, were doing. Uh, so they, you want to define gravity in asymptotically flat space times in terms of some boundary conditions out at infinity where the theory sort of naturally linearizes itself and you have control and you know what's going on. Uh, and then they wanted to uh, sort of classify and understand the group of uh, large dithyomorphisms, large in the sense that they don't approach uh, the identity on the boundary of the space-time. So they're interested in those uh, physical transformations because since they don't vanish here, they actually change the boundary data. So they're moving you around in the phase space of the theory. They have finite non-zero charges, uh, which will act non-trivially on the Hilbert space once you quantize. Uh, so they're not small, uh, redundant descriptions of the same states in the Hilbert space. They're actual physical transformations which map you from one distinct physical state into a different uh, physical state. Uh, so uh, if, if that idea is not uh, super familiar to you, uh, a nice a little baby example to keep in mind is just the U1 gauge theory, where if you have fields which are uh, charged under the electromagnetic field, you know that there's a huge uh, gauge redundancy in the theory, which amounts to doing some local phase rotation uh, by some parameter which can depend on the space-time coordinates. And for all of these uh, alphas which uh, go to zero at the boundary, you know that those are just redundant descriptions of the same states, uh, so you quotient out by them when you construct the Hilbert space. But if you just take this alpha to be a constant so that it doesn't uh, vanish at the boundary, that's just a global U1 charge rotation. That's an actual symmetry of the theory. It has a conserved quantity, which is just the electromagnetic charge. <laughs> okay, so BMS group is just some sort of big boy version of, of that story. Uh, so. Uh, the group is sort of easiest to derive in terms of uh, just the metric ansatz in a particular set of coordinates, but it can be derived and shown to exist without any uh, coordinate-dependent statements. 
Uh, so the original analysis was done uh, in what are called Bondi coordinates. So you basically just ask for the metric to be at a uh, leading order, just a flat metric on uh, Minkowski space time, and then you can have sub leading uh, corrections to this metric. tell you about the actual phase space of the theorem. So this bonding mass aspect basically tells you about the, the total monopole mass of the space-time. This CZZ tells you about uh, gravitational radiation, which passes through scry. It's retarded time derivative is the bonding news, um, which is sort of the invariant characterization of gravitational radiation in asymptotically flat uh, space-times. Uh, so the BMS group is just going to be defined as the group of dithiomorphisms, which leave the leading piece of this uh, asymptotic expansion fixed, but they can generically move around uh, the, the perturbations of the metric. Uh, so it, it's not a very difficult calculation to do. Uh, you want to basically just solve an asymptotic uh, killing equation, and what you will find is that the vector fields are parameterized by basically uh, two quantities, and then there's of course subleading pieces which aren't important for the asymptotic analysis. Uh, so there's one free function on the sphere, which we'll call f, and this guy is basically responsible for the, uh, the infinite dimensional extension of the Poincaré group. So these guys in the literature are called super translations. Basically, so, uh, so I've just chosen basically stereographic coordinates on, on this sphere at infinity. So what super translations do is more or less just move you by different amounts along the different null generators of scry, depending on where you're sitting uh, on the celestial sphere. Okay. Uh, so this was sort of the, the big surprise in the 1960s, and people worked really hard for a long time to see if you could kill it and find a way to break this down just to the ordinary finite dimensional Poincaré group. Uh, but it's actually not possible to do that without eliminating most of the interesting radiative uh, solutions. So uh, we now pretty much understand that this is the correct, uh, this is at least a part of the correct asymptotic symmetry group for asymptotically flat uh, space times. This other quantity which appears in the asymptotic uh, killing vectors, this y, which is a vector field on the sphere, is a conformal killing vector. So uh, these guys are realizing the action of the Lorentz group, SL2C, uh, as the, the, the group of conformal motions of the sphere. Okay, and uh, so that, that's uh, sort of an old analysis. It was done in the 1960s. Uh, these days, when quantum field theorists see SL2C acting on the sphere, they get very excited because they know that there are a lot of systems uh, in nature which enjoy this global symmetry, which also enjoy a large enhanced symmetry, where basically you are now allowed to do local conformal transformations. So the, the global uh, elements of this group basically just amount to y's being proportional to 1z or z squared, uh, but there's sort of a local extension of this group where you just uh, allow y to be a holomorphic function of z. Uh, so this is a much larger, much more constraining symmetry. It plays a tremendous role in two-dimensional conformal field theories. It allows you to calculate a lot because it moves a lot of questions about dynamics into kinematics. Uh, so there's sort of a natural conjecture which was floated over the past decade that maybe actually the asymptotic symmetry group for asymptotically flat space times contains not just uh, the super translations, but also these sort of super rotations, which enhance uh, the global SLTC to a local conformal action on the sphere. <coughs> okay, so that's sort of uh, some proposed large symmetry group, which might be relevant for 
quantum gravity in, in four dimensions. Uh, so then you have to ask what would be the, the physical implications or the consequences of this symmetry. It's not really interesting unless it's, it's useful for something. So it should give us relations between different uh, physical observables, maybe between S matrix elements, something like that. Um, and at first that seems like a little bit of a puzzle because for a long time people have known how to calculate uh, perturbative graviton scattering amplitudes and it would be surprising if they didn't see some hint of this huge uh, symmetry. It would be difficult to miss infinite numbers of relationships between S matrix elements. So there's, they're conserved quantities corresponding to the super translations and super rotations? Yeah, so the, the super translations, they basically amount to uh, conservation of a local energy. So the, the charges basically look like integrals of some moment of the bonding mass aspect. So you know that if you integrate this guy over the whole sphere, that gives you the total uh, mass of the space-time. But, you know, a priori, this guy can depend on angles, and then uh, it's sort of measuring for you the, the energy in a particular direction of the sphere. And these are the quantities which are conserved in that case. And there's analogs uh, for these for these super rotations. They're basically just local generalizations of loose rotation. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it, it turns out that actually about the same time that the BMS group was being derived in the relativity community, particle theorists were investigating the infrared structure of, of gauge theory and, and gravitational uh, theory S matrix elements. So actually in the 1960s, Steve Weinberg, uh, in an effort to show that, uh, that the perturbative quantum gravity uh, S matrix elements uh, can sort of be well, basically, that the, the theory is predictive and free of infrared problems, derived what's called Weinberg's soft graviton theorems. And although he probably wouldn't have used this language back then, what he really derived was an infinite set of uh, relationships between different S matrix elements. In, in theories of gravity. So basically, uh, what he showed was if you have some generic uh, scattering process in four dimensional gravity, which just has some arbitrary number of uh, external particles, one of which is a graviton, and then you look at the amplitude, uh, the amplitude's limit when you take the graviton's momentum to zero, something very nice happens, which is just that all of the dependence on this soft graviton insertion factors out into some universal operators which depend explicitly on the soft graviton's momentum acting on the same amplitude but without uh, the graviton insertion. So physically, physically what's happening here is just you're taking the wavelength of this graviton to be very large uh, so it's no longer able to resolve very short distance physics, so it just sort of sees in this limit a lot of energetic particles having some point interaction, and so it just couples to their conserved quantum numbers, and that's basically what these operators are doing for you. Uh, so, yeah, and sort of this is an infinite set of uh, relations because this Q really can be any uh, soft limit, uh, any you can have any direction for the, for the graviton's momentum, which basically gives you this local set of relations on the sphere. Uh, and so it turns out that uh, what you can show is that uh, the invariance of the quantum gravity S matrix under these super translation symmetries is basically just uh, casting this leading Weinberg soft theorem as a ward identity for super translation. Okay. And then this, this subleading piece of the soft theorem, which was uh, it took several decades actually to discover this, but this turned out to also be a universal term in the factorization formula. This guy can simply be recast as a, um, as a word identity for these enhanced uh, local conformal transformations, these, these super rotations. And you can do a little bit more. You can find uh, an operator written in terms of the, the Bondi News tensor, which when you insert it into S matrix elements, gives you exactly 
the Ward identity for two-dimensional energy momentum tensor, which is sort of very characteristic of two-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, so it seems like there is a very nice two-dimensional structure hiding within four-dimensional asymptotically flat gravity, and it's an extremely powerful symmetry, so if it turns out to be consistently realized in the theory, it would give you a lot of confidence. Uh, well, there's a couple of natural questions. I mean, the first of all is whether or not this symmetry is consistently realized at loop level. People are, including myself, investigating that right now. So we're writing a paper. There's sort of naive problems which one encounters with infrared divergences at loop level. And, uh, there's a one loop exact correction to this software in which naively looks like an anomaly. But, so that's a question, and well, you, you can hope that, that these symmetries uh, are going to be sort of an organizing principle.